on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. OU legend Kenny Stills joins us for quite possibly the most interesting interview we've ever done. And that's it. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hosty, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, July 2nd, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by River Wind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades, and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of july all you gotta do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now recording this episode a few days in advance got some fourth of july travel plans ted let's go best holiday of the year you think okay so i i'm starting to feel that way as well it's like the most stress-free mm-hmm. you eat, you drink. There's none of the stress really uh, that comes with Thanksgiving and Christmas. I feel like it's, is it number one? It's number one. Yeah. It's number one. You can accomplish everything you can Thanksgiving and Christmas without the, the stress, the anxiety, Did I get everyone a gift? Did I get the right gift? Are they going to like it? Are they going to hate it? Is everything perfect? What about the decorations that we put out a month early? There's, there's so much going on. Fourth of July, you get some like red, blue and white solo cups. Decorations are done. You can have all the cuisine you want. The only stress that comes is like, what is your affinity for fireworks? Like, does that, does that, bother you and are you stressed about putting on the fireworks show other than that yeah that's that's pretty much it find yourself some cold beverages and a body of water and here we go that's it that's it i like it all right so this is i'd say this is the most interesting interview we have ever done yeah with kenny stills yes and there is some strong language we always like to throw in a, a warning when there's strong language in, in an interview, but he is, he's a guy I admire Ted. Uh, I really do. And he was younger than me at OU. We had a really good relationship in college. We have a good relationship now, but his ability to just talk about his feelings, you know, things he's been through just everything just the dude is an open book and i admire the hell out of that yeah yeah i mean there's 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 no doubt about it i um i'm fascinated with the guy i i what i love the most is that he seems to be in just the best place you could ever be right happy healthy um you know, excited about waking up the next day and, you know, whether it's serving the community or doing some, some adventure to some immersion therapy adventure style. I mean, he's seems to be in a great spot. I couldn't be more thrilled for the guy. Yeah. And we are, we're fired up for y'all to listen to it. So here is OU legend, Kenny Stills. It is our pleasure to be joined by an OU legend. He also happened to play nine years in the National Football League, and he is one of the most interesting people that I know. Kenny Stills is in the house. Mr. Stills, how are we doing, sir? Like I said, bro, I'm living the dream, man. I appreciate y'all having me. It's good seeing your faces, and uh, I'm hyped to catch up a little bit today. So I am I'm very excited for this interview because 
you're just you're doing all kinds of stuff, man. But I I, I do want to start with the football piece. Have have you called it a career? Are you officially done playing? Have you made that decision? I have not made any official decisions. Um, my agent is still, you know, talking to teams and fielding, you know, those types of requests. But I don't have any desire really to get back out there on the field. So um, I just need to file the paperwork and, and make it official. Wait until after training camp. Yeah. I was like – Training camp is the worst. If you could get past that and still be available, maybe catch on a little bit, maybe give yourself some time. Like that's the hard part. Like yeah. I always look at those guys and say, man, that that's gotta be awesome to uh, let the most difficult part of the year slide by and come in whenever everyone's already used uh, half, of, half of their gas tank. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great advice. And that's the same advice I'm getting from my agent. Um, and you just never know what happens with injuries, right? Like last year, it wasn't a big year, a big year for receivers to go down. So there wasn't many calls and many workouts for receivers. And so it just always kind of rotates. And, you know, I, you never hope that anybody has an injury or anything like that. But, um, you know, if those opportunities come and you want to be able to be available and ready. So this is, I, I don't even know if this is a fair question, but looking at your NFL career, did you... Did you get everything out of it that you were hoping to get? hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, obviously you, you want to be, you want to win a Super Bowl. You want to be all pro. You want to like have all these different accolades, but when it comes to the relationships that I made um, and the things that I've been able to do, you know, to change the trajectory of my family forever, um, you know, I, I came in with the goal of taking care of my mom, taking care of my family. Like I, I went to the NFL to take care of my family and, um, I, I was able to do that. You know, my mom hasn't worked a day, uh, you know, since I got drafted, you know, she does some odd jobs here and there cause she wants to, but she had, she's been retired, you know, through me since, uh, the day that I got drafted. And so, uh, to be able to take care of her and, you know, help out my siblings when they need it and, you know, just be, a light in my family that was the goal for me and so um you always can want more but you know I feel like I I did what you know I was supposed to do you know it's interesting and it, you know the NFL is such a different dynamic you know we talk about college football mainly on here but you know the NFL locker room is a, it's a totally different dynamic you have like a whole different a wide range of motivations right in, in college it's like we're going to win championships. We're, you know, setting ourselves up to make the next step, you know, get an education, you go to the NFL, and, you know, some guys want to make a ton of money. Other guys want to, you know, take care of their families, win championships. Like who, who maybe helped you or did you look to, to, to figure out how to carry yourself to achieve what it was that you wanted to achieve? Cause there's a lot of different personalities in there and you can associate with different people who, who, you know, really either that you found or found you and led you down that path? Yeah, I, I would say that I learned a bunch from all of the teams that I was on. There was never like one individual that I looked to, but there was always situations where I saw, you know, like a guy go chase a contract and go play for a team that might not have been, you know, as good or had has as much potential and see how that works out. Or, you know, just like you see how things play out for other people and then you're able to be more real about, the situations that you're in and the decisions that you make. And so, um, yeah, I just paid attention a lot to what was happening around the league and, and try to make, you know, the best decisions for myself. I was in the shower today thinking about, you know, I, I made an agent change after like year six or, you know, after I got my second contract, I made an agent change. And just like all the decisions that you make, you look back on them and it's like, you try to just be real with yourself about, you know, Hey, was that a mistake or did, you know, was that the right thing to do? Or was that just, you know, how things worked out. And so um, I don't have any regrets by any means. Um, but, you know, the motivation does change, right? At first it was taking care of mom and then it's like, okay, well, you know, how do I put out the best product? How do I, you know, fine tune myself to be the best player that I can be? And who knows what that is, you know? And so just being able to, you know, get back to work and, and find those different ways to motivate yourself to go out there and, and perform and play. Was it ever difficult for you to find that balance of motivation, right? And not just be driven because I think a lot of guys are exactly like you. It's about taking care of your family. 
It's about making money and taking care of your family. How, how did you handle balancing that with also kind of working on your craft and, and, and focusing on the football? Well, that's, I think, I mean, that, that's the most important part was, was working on the craft. Cause I knew if I was good, that everything else, you know, I, I performed well, I stayed healthy, then everything else would fall in line. I'd be able to take care of mom. I'd be able to, you know, take care of the family. And so I was always fine tuning the craft, you know, that's, that's my thing. You know, I love the weight room. I love training. I was always trying to find different ways to train and take care of the body. I got into Pilates. I was, you know, doing all this stuff, you know, early in my career to make sure that I was going to be able to play for as long as I wanted to. And to be able to play nine years and not have any major injuries, um, you know, no concussions, anything like that. And so it's like, I, you know, who knows how long I could have, you know, continued to play. But at the same time, it's like, I'm also happy with, you know, the things that I was able to do and the place that I'm in and super interested in uh, the next chapter, you know, that that's in life. I'm 31 years old. I got all the time in the world to be able to explore and figure out what else, you know, I'm passionate about and care about and how I can, um, you know, leave my mark and, you know, on this, on, on earth, you know, what, what my legacy will actually be outside of just playing ball. You know, it's funny just listening to that. You're 31 years old, which, you know, is incredibly young. You have your full life ahead of you, but when it comes to football, like, you know, the, you're one of the older guys in the locker room. So what was that dynamic like for you as, as a young guy kind of taking it all in and then, finding yourself as one of the older guys in the locker room and maybe being a bit of a mentor to some guys. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it, it goes by so fast and all the old heads always tell you that when you're young and you never believe it, but it, it truly does just fly by. My attitude was always just to, you know, find the guys that I looked up to and follow and, and do everything that they did, you know? So it was Marcus Colston and Lance Moore and Robert Meacham. And then, you know, we had, the list goes on with that Saint squad. And, you know, at first I had little injuries here and there and they would go and be like, okay, we're getting dry needles. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And they're like, yes, you are. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I go in there and boom. So sure enough, I started getting dry needled. I stopped having soft tissue injuries and, you know, the same type of things I passed on to the next generation of guys. They come in, they've had soft, you know, soft tissue injuries. I'm like, look, you're going to go get dry needled. I'll pay for you to get dry needled. I promise you this shit works. Same thing with Pilates. You know, I was like, I started doing Pilates. It was helping me out. I felt strong. I felt like, you know, it was keeping me from having injuries. I'm like, look, I'll pay for your first five Pilates sessions, but you just got to go do it and give it a try. I promise this stuff's going to help you. And so just trying to take the things that the old heads taught us and, and really pass them down to the young guys, knowing that, you know, if we all lift each other up, you know, we're going to have a better team. So you had... You started in New Orleans where you got drafted. Mm. Then, then you were in Miami, then Houston. Take a little stop in Buffalo also. Yep. For the playoffs, didn't actually play there, but I was there. What What? What was the most enjoyable stop for you? And, and that I always ask it that way because it's weird. It's not always where you have the most success or you win the most, where you were having the most fun and you were having, you know, kind of, enjoying it the most what what was the most enjoyable stop for you I think about like different peaks and valleys throughout the career the first year that we had well my rookie year was sweet and I didn't realize how um good of a locker room we had how good of the guys you know group of guys we had and how lucky I was to just be around you know Jimmy Graham and Darren Sproles and Pierre Thomas like all these dudes that are ballers and just like solid human beings and so when I left there after, you know, I got, when I got traded to Miami and I got in a new locker room, it just was, it was different, you know? And, I, and then I, that was the first time that I really appreciated what I had beforehand. And I kind of were like, me, I miss Drew Brees. I miss yeah, him a lot. I miss, I miss all, you know, all those guys. It was just a totally different environment, right? They had won a Super Bowl before and, you know, they were like a finely tuned machine. We're like coming to Miami. We're kind of young. We had our head coach gets fired. There's all this stuff going on. And so I think about that peak. And then I think about Adam Gase's first year. We win like 10 games in a row and go to the playoffs. And like we're running the ball. Nobody can stop us in the outside zone. The receivers are blocking their asses off. It's like we were just in a groove. And it, it felt so good. You know, we made the playoffs for the first time. So I think about that. And then 
you think about being in Houston, I think the best team that I've ever been on was the Houston team, uh, the 2019 Houston team. We were up, you know, 24 to zero or something on the Chiefs at, in Kansas City in the playoffs. And they they beat us and then go on to win the Super Bowl. And it's like, we, we're killing these dudes. They couldn't, they couldn't handle us. And so I think about, you know, those three peaks um, in my career. And then it's, 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 they're all different, but also impactful and, have, and have like have left such a mark on me. We'll get you back to the interview. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch the price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Love's also have you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to-go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamore. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise and is the best place to get your OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. If you want to live your life and better yourself comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And hey, you hungry out there? Well, then head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. Their food is fantastic, and it is the perfect spot to watch any big game. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. All right, back to the interview. Yeah, those three peaks. Um, the for- No one knows the formula, right? Everyone's always in search of the truth. But what are some of the characteristics that you found carry over from one team to the next? Like you can walk in and kind of identify a couple of things that are happening that you see from successful teams that you've been a part of. And then some things maybe of, some teams that struggle a little bit more, I, you know, as you've put it together and you lay out like your history, like what does that formula look like to you? It's different, honestly, in every place, you know, and, and um, in New Orleans, you know, like I said, those guys had won a Super Bowl, so they were finally tuned. Everything that they did was like to the second, you know, Drew is so meticulous about how he does things and Sean and how they run things. So it was, you know, in and out, you know, you're there 7.15, you're out by 3.30 or 4 o'clock. And it was like Drew had to be home to see his kids. And, you know, and so it just like, that's a totally different environment. A lot of those guys weren't spending a lot of time hanging out like off, uh, like away from the field on the offensive side, at least, because, you know, they're more veteran, had families, you know, had wives. And so when I first got there, I was like, yeah, I really missed college. Like I was texting, you know, all the guys back in college, I would go up to LSU and, and hang out with the with those guys that were still in school, but totally different environment, just like real professional, real business. Then you go to Miami in, in that second peak and we're a younger team, you know, and we work hard, we're feisty. Uh, we spend a lot of time together off the field. You know, those guys are, we're together doing, you know, going to dinner, going to lunch, going out. Um, and we were all like, we just had that vibe and that connection and we all played for each other. And so, um, I think that that was what kind of made the difference on that team. And then, I mean, in Houston, we had Deshaun Watson, the guy's like a superhero, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, we had, we had, um, like just a three headed monster at receiver. We had crazy good running backs. Offensive line was nice. We just, we were, we were stacked. You know, and those guys all hung out outside the field together. We had the, that connection as well. Um, and so it just, it was different in every place. It's hard to like put one formula together, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot of value in guys getting to know each other off the field. Um, so that way when you're out there, you know, playing together, you're able to sacrifice for those guys. You have a better connection for them. You care about them more and uh, you actually have a real team. As a wide receiver, clearly your quarterback. Uh, I mean, that's that's a huge part of what you do, right? 
how how did you approach different quarterbacks throughout your career? Like, how, how did you approach developing a relationship with Drew Brees versus developing a relationship with Deshaun Watson? Because, like you said, I assume those those guys are in two very different parts of life, right? When you're yeah. crossing paths with them. Yeah, when Drew, it was just like show up and do everything he asked me to do it, however he wanted me to do it. And as many times as he wanted me to do it, you know, and that was my thing is like, I, I feel like I've always taken pride of being in good shape and taking care of my body. So, you know, we're running around during practice, you know, we mess something up, we drop a ball or a ball's missed, then we're getting that rep after practice and we're going to make it perfect until, you know, the quarterback feels like it's right. Um, you know, then you, you, you know, my relationship with, with Ryan was a little bit different. Ryan is like, has to see it has to be repped in order for us to run it into game. You know, so we're going to go out there and rep it, rep it, rep it as much as many times as possible to make sure that he feels like he knows this thing and he can throw the ball with his eyes closed, you know, which was always a challenge in Miami with the humidity and the heat. You know, it was like we were really getting it in out there and I made the conscious decision to move to the East Coast so I could be around whenever Ryan wanted to throw. So, if, you know, whatever it was before OTAs or, when, you know, in, in the summertime, whenever he picked the ball up, I'm like, yo, I, I live here. Call me. Let's go. Well, you know, I wanted him and I to be on the same page for everything, just natural timing and, um, you know, as many repetitions as possible. Where Deshaun is more like he can make it happen. <laughs> he doesn't need to. He doesn't need the reps to tell him what you're going to do. He's like a visual guy and he'll just let it. He'll sling it, you know, and so. Um, Similar, you know, as far as like making sure we get the reps, but at the same time, he just was like a lot more backyard, uh, even though, you know, he, he's a pocket passer and he's got all the attributes of, of like being able to do both. He uh, is just a lot more comfortable kind of, you know, winging, winging it, going on, the, going with the flow. That's so interesting to think about it. Like that's literally like the full spectrum of quarterback. Mm -hmm. you've got the less talented guy that maybe doesn't have the arm but is so detailed and meticulous in his approach then you've got you know a guy that is a bit of a gunslinger you know he he kind of attacks things and then you've got like the ultimate talent that can just almost show up and do it all how do you think it would have affected you had you maybe gone to the guy that had all the talent in the world first instead of maybe seeing it through the eyes of a, a guy that, you know, practiced or prepared like Drew Brees, do you think it would have been different? Do you think that helped mold the the player you became? Yeah. You mean playing with Drew? Playing yeah. with Drew, yeah, 100% helped me to, to be – I was that way already with Landry in college. Whatever he wanted, we could do. You know, it's like I just – for me, I understand the relationship between quarterback and receiver, and I can't do anything without them. So – if you need me to do this a hundred million times and we're going to do it until it's rep so that in the game, when my number's called, it works. Cause when it doesn't work, most of the time, it's not like, Oh, the quarterback, it's like, Oh, the receiver didn't do this or do that. And so I, I want to make sure I'm on top of my stuff. And so to be with Drew, it was like, you knew you didn't want to mess up, especially as a rookie and a fifth round draft pick. I didn't want to drop a ball. I didn't want to be in the wrong place. I didn't, you know, so I was up late at night studying with the backup quarterback and making sure I knew everyone's job in my position. So they were never looking at me like, yo, rookie, what are you doing? And yeah, that carries over, that carried over to the rest of my career in the way that, you know, I tried to teach the other receivers to be is like, hey, you, you got to understand, like, <laughs> mouthing off and talking shit to the quarterback is not going to get you the ball. <laughs> so you guys, you got to figure out a way to become cool with this dude some way, somehow, you know, and um, I think those are the really cool types of lessons that we learn by playing ball. You know, it's like, these are life lessons too. It's like, you're not going to maybe like everybody that you work with all the time, but you got to figure out how to make that shit work. Cause it's, you know, for the team, it's for a bigger cause. Yeah. Now when you look at your NFL career, made a lot of plays, made a lot of money. And I, I think a lot of people started to associate you with what you were doing with things off the field, right? Or political stances you were taking on the field, right? And that became a big part of kind of who you were as an NFL player. What, what did that feel like, right? Where it became, it became 
not just about what you were doing on the field as a wide receiver. It became about all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think it just gave me an extra added sense of responsibility. You know, there's a, there's a group of people that I felt like I would, you know, was representing, I was representing for sure. And, you know, the people that supported me and had my back and, you know, were making, you know, making sure that I didn't feel like I was out there alone during this time. Um, I just, I felt like a, a bigger responsibility. And I think it helped me to even tighten up my game that much more. You know, it was a lot of opportunity for people to say that I wasn't focused or I was focused on the wrong things or what have you. And so it, it really uh, gave me that added sense of responsibility and made sure, made me make sure that I was on top of my stuff. Did you ever get any pushback in the locker room or within the organization? Oh, yeah. I mean. I mean, he did call out the owner of the team he was playing for. <laughs> which I'll a, never I'm, forget reading that notification. I was like, Kenny did what now? <laughs> Just definitely had pushback, you know, from the ownership level um, all the way down. Everyone, GM, head coach, assistant coaches, players on the team, um, a lot of cussing and finger pointing and um, really tough conversations, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I had a very strong feeling about what I was doing. And the more that I educated myself on the on protests and our history uh, as a country, the more I felt even, and, you know, even more empowered with the decision that I made. And so, um, yeah, it became a part of, who people knew me as, but I tried to continue to level up in the way that I was playing and be a good representation of, you know, the things that, that I was standing for. Did Brian Flores really play that many Jay-Z songs in a row? Yeah. 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 And he did. It was, it's that whole situation was, was pretty funny because I knew it was like all these things were happening in a row. Right. It was like, I had called out, Stephen Ross for being a hypocrite or being a little hypocritical. And then they, the NFL signs the partnership with Rock Nation and Jay-Z. Jay-Z says that we're past the kneeling, that he talked to Kaepernick. And they asked me in an interview the next day, like, have you talked to Jay-Z? Did he, do you, you know, are you are like, are we past the kneeling stuff? And I'm like, look, I never talked to Jay-Z. He's never talked to Colin. I talked to Colin and I don't know who Jay-Z knows. That's like a regular person, you know, like a, that, what people that he knows that live outside of his community, like people in the streets, but no one has ever told me that they were past any kneeling. And there's no reason to put down somebody else because of what you're doing, right? He signs a contract with the, with the league. There's no reason for him to even mention Colin or, or the protest at all. You know, I don't, it just was weird to me that somebody was putting somebody else down as they were like making moves to the top. And uh, I, I disagree with that. And they thought, I guess, that they could get underneath my skin or like try and rile me up by playing Jay-Z music uh, the next day at practice. And yeah, so they played like all Jay-Z the whole day. And um, I thought it was funny. I was talking shit to him, telling him that the music sucked. And, uh, you know, just because that's that's my thing, right? It's like, you want to talk shit, then let's talk shit. Like, we're both grown men, right? You're the head coach. I'm a captain of the team at the time. I've been two captain the last two years in a row. He gets hired there. And now it's like, you know, whatever. I'm not a captain at the time, but I was the last two years. And you want to have some beef? Then let's, let's do it. You know, first day of practice, we, get, we have pads on. He comes out. He's like, I want to see if any of my receivers can block. I want to see if any of my receivers can block, talk, like walking by me talking shit. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I was on the front side of that 75, 75 yard run for a touchdown when we beat that ass last year. Like, don't come over here talking shit to me. <laughs> if you want to talk shit to the rookies or somebody, go ahead. But I do my thing. I'm getting paid $10 million a year this year. Like, I don't know who the fuck you're talking to. And like, that's, that's my attitude. <laughs> that's how my parents raised me. Like, we're men. You want respect, give respect. I don't care who you are. And especially on the football field, especially on the football field. And so um, I think that Flo might have felt a little threatened and that's okay. <laughs> so what was the reaction from the rest of the team when that whole situation went down? Because it's not like you were just standing alone, right? Whenever that music was like, I'm sure 
was there like and a divide or team think the team thought it was like the guys think it's funny right they're like trying to stir shit up we're like I had been through so much already with the protests and the way people were talking to me, the messages that I got on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. So they're not, there's not very much that anyone could say to get underneath my skin, right? And I thought that it was just weird because like I said, I was a captain, right? You're a new head coach. You would want to have a relationship with the captain, right? Like trying to build the team together. And like, I'm, I'm not a standoffish type of person. When you come, you know, I, I'm introduce myself, whatever I can do to help, obviously like I, I want to win. And so then we start talking shit and one person gets sensitive and the other person does it. Then it's like, well, I didn't start that. You did. And so the team started to see that I was getting underneath his skin because we end up getting to like a shouting match uh, with each other at practice. He's like calling me out like you're going first and one on one. So I hadn't been doing one on ones because I was hurt, but I still stepped up, went out there, got busy. And then as I like made the catch, because I crush this dude on the stop route I look back at him like what's up <laughs> none of your dudes can stop me like I don't know why you're fucking with me I'm the wrong one straight up and so something else happened and then immediately after practice we had a team meeting and in the team meeting instead of talking about practice he was talking about the shit that I said like cussing out the whole team saying some wild shit that I, I wouldn't repeat because it would it would just it was it was bad and after the meeting, everybody on the team came up to me like, damn, Kenny, what'd you do? What'd you do? And I'm like, nothing. And I, he just saw how much power I had on the team, really, because I, I knew those guys and we worked together. And like, I, you know, I've been leading that team. And so it was the writing was on the wall when it came to me, you know, calling uh, Stephen Ross a hypocrite and then kind of having a little tiff with him. I knew that I was going to be out of there. It was just a matter of how long. So I'm assuming that when you got that call that you were getting traded to Houston, you were not surprised? Oh, no. Not at all. Not at all. I was surprised that they included Tunzel in that deal. Uh, so was everyone else, pal. <laughs> that was surprising. When I said me and Tunzel, I'm like, what the hell? Who proved that? But, I mean, I was extremely happy to be going somewhere else with, with Tons. Tons a good dude. I love him. And so it, it made that transition so much easier going to Houston. And I mean, there was pushback in Houston as soon as I got there too. Like, you know, nobody can take a knee here in the state of Texas. No one's ever done that. And it was just, it followed me everywhere. And I had to continue to just stand on ten, my 10 toes and, and the things that I believe in. And um, I feel like, you know, when, when you're getting pushback for some things, sometimes you're doing the right thing. You know, and, and that's okay. You got to be able to stand in the fire and, and keep your head up high and, and uh, you know, keep a good heart about it. What's, what's the, you know, football-wise, what's the process like going through a trade? <laughs> like just, you know, getting the avalanche and new stuff to learn and trying to figure out what your role is going to be. And, you know, there's new personalities, new, new people to try and uh, build a relationship with. Yeah. Yeah, the first one I was in the off season um, here in California when they like I think it was during the draft or something that I got traded from New Orleans to Miami. Uh, so I had a lot more time, you know, in that transition process of you know getting out there, finding a place, getting used to the team. That was a year that uh, our head coach got fired like second or third game in, so we our team was not really worth much. Um, Dan Campbell stepped in and was like the interim coach and we had a little juice for a little while, but we were just kind of holding on. And then when I got traded to Houston, it was the week before the first game. So I had done all training camp with the Dolphins. And then it was literally the week before Monday night football, we were going to play the Saints to open the season. So I had not much time to do anything. I moved there, was in the hotel, was studying the plays that I was in on for the game. And, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to get used to the guys and, and build a relationship. And, and that just happened, you know, quickly over that season. We had a really good team and a bunch of cool dudes. So it, it made it really easy. The process really simple. But, yeah, I ended up catching what should have been the game winner uh, against the Saints on Monday Night Football in my first game there. We give Drew too much time uh, on the clock to go down and, and kick a field goal and beat us. But, yeah, it's different. It's different every time. 
and uh, some teams do it better than others as far as like wel welcoming guys and making sure that they're taken care of, uh, you know, helping everything get shipped and sent and finding a new place and, you know, having that uh, player development guy that's like on top of everything. So I always, it seemed to be fairly smooth for me. I, gr I moved a lot growing up. So I'm very comfortable kind of just bouncing around. It's why you kind of see me now never in one place because we moved like once a year my whole life. You know, my mom worked uh, at apartment complexes. She was managing them. And so even if we weren't moving to another city, we would move like within the complex for some reason. And so very comfortable, uh, you know, kind of moving around and popping around. Yeah, let, let's get to that. So where's home base now, man? I saw you in Aspen. You were living in Aspen. Are you a mountain man now? Like what, what's the deal? I am just going with the flow. The last place that I had a lease in was Aspen, Colorado. Yes. This winter I moved there uh, to snowboard and to become one with nature in the mountain. You know, I didn't grow up uh, on the mountain that often, maybe a handful of times, you know, in, in my childhood. And, um, I wanted to take this chance and this opportunity to go out there and, and get outside, you know, and I felt like I really connected with snowboarding over the last couple of years, being able to get just immediately in the flow state when you put your boots on and get into those bindings and to be outside on a mountain in the snow, um, going fast, you're getting that adrenaline, you know, I was, I was kind of trying to find a way to fill the hole and the gap of, you know, not running around and making plays and, you know, putting my body on people and, um and snowboarding has done that for me uh, it's filled my cup in a way that you know I didn't think was going to be possible like directly out of the game and so I was just trying to spend as much time as I could this year doing that I probably got like 85 90 days and I started doing some split boarding stuff and doing some back country and side country and, and really just like getting outside and getting away from uh technology and and really connecting with mother nature and it's been um like one of the greatest decisions that I made. That's awesome. When, when did you go do the bowl for the first time? <laughs> I did the bowl the first time a couple of years ago. I was definitely out of my league, had no, no idea what I was doing when it comes to the altitude and, and the hike, but then also just in the terrain, you know, but uh, that is an incredible hike. I'm, I'm actually afraid of heights. So uh, every time I go on that hike, it's a little bit of a challenge, but, I have been trying to go at all of these things that, you know, bring fear out in me. So it's, you know, you're afraid of heights. Let's go skydiving. Let's go bungee jumping. Let's climb the mountain. You know, you're afraid of, of the ocean. I, you know, I started surfing the last couple of years and trying to get more comfortable sitting out there on the water on my surfboard alone and um, just going towards these things that are, you know, putting fear in my heart and in my head and, and trying to just become more comfortable. You know, we always talk about, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Right. And it's like, how, how do we really do that? And it's, you know, to challenge ourselves and to build resilience um, by doing that. We'll get you back to the interview, but first. Bishop McGinnis Catholic high school represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma city. Grounded in a faith-based education, students prepare to meet their potential with an individualized academic path that strives for success. Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSS AA athletics, where they've won over 100 state championships, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org financial aid is available and attention business owners you need insurica in your life insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout oklahoma texas and the southwest insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers they compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order on a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. 
I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. All right, back to the interview. So you've been traveling all over the world. <laughs> uh, I keep up with all of it on Instagram. It's uh, the Instagram games is strong, man. I mean, it just it, it's fantastic stuff. Where, where have you traveled lately that like, what's the best place you've been? Like where, where, where have you enjoyed the most? We were, I was just in Italy, uh, like, like on the coast, Malfi coast. And we did this path of the gods hike that like, you got to look it up or go if, if you haven't gone, it's like, it blew my mind. It's, a, it's two and a half hours one way. So we kind of drove to the top and then went and hiked back towards Positano. But um, just like avatar type stuff everywhere. The whole hike, you're looking down at the water, but you're also seeing these rocks and trees. And it just like blew my mind, blew my mind. And then I got to go and see my first volcano, uh, Mount Etna, which is like super active uh, volcano, but not scary active because i guess the more times that there are eruptions the less likely it's going to have like a, a big banger eruption so just learning about that type of stuff and i was never like i was a true jock like football baseball basketball football baseball basketball track like just always running around doing sports like that and so to be able to just like be outside in nature and start camping and hiking and doing these things. It's, it's um, a learning curve. It's a new learning curve and it's challenging me, but it's, it's, you know, it's, there's not much better than being able to spend some time outside. Yeah. I'm interested about like what got you. So snowboarding, did you, were you skateboarder growing up some, like what got you interested in that Avenue? <laughs> I tried to skateboard growing up being a California kid. But, you know, you try to do a couple of tricks, you fall a couple of times, the board hits you in the shins too many times. You're like, no, nah, I'm over this. You know, yeah, I've never it. understood. Like, that's typically a skateboard fall is one where you're like, I'm done. Yeah, I, I'm done with that. So it wasn't, you know, I didn't I we went snowboarding, like I said, a handful of times. But um, I went. It's not easy to pick up if you just go like intermittently. It, it's pretty difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I was super lucky that a family friend got uh, a lesson for me a couple of years ago. And when I got that lesson, uh, it changed everything. Right. Cause my dad was a skier. So if we would go riding together. He didn't know what to tell me, you know, like, stay on your heels, you know? So I would literally stay on my heels and go as fast as I could in one direction, stop, and then go as fast as I could in the other direction. And that was how I snowboarded. And so I get a lesson. They teach me about the curvature of the board and how it works and how you can manipulate it. And um, that was when the light came on. And I was lucky enough to get a couple powder days on that same trip. And it was like hooked, immediately hooked. You know, you get out there on a powder day, you can fall and it's no big deal, right? It's soft, soft snow, you can go as fast as you want. And um, I knew right then and there, I think that was like three years ago now that I wanted to spend more time in the mountains. And so this past year, I told myself if I didn't play that I would move, you know, somewhere in the mountains. And I went and tried out for Cleveland in like October, October, November, maybe. And they were like, we're going to stay with our young guys. You know, you're the first one on the list if something goes down. And at that point, I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to wait around here. You know, I'm going to go somewhere where, uh, and I could enjoy the winter time. And so I moved to Aspen. It was tough to find a place to live out there. Everything's fairly expensive. And uh, there's a lot of people there, you know, trying to trying to find a place to stay. And so I was kind of just couch surfing and uh, doing like little Airbnbs. And then finally found somebody that would let me uh, rent out their place for a couple months. And it's like I said, one of the best decisions I've ever made, man, to be able to wake up in the morning, eat a power bar or whatever, have a glass of orange juice and then get on a mountain and ride until you can't feel your legs anymore and then come home and stretch and hot tub and do whatever, you know, chores and responsibilities I have. But I was literally just a big kid playing outside for a couple hours a day, every day. And um, I had the biggest smile on my face uh, just from getting on the board and, and being on the mountain and that that's a good workout too right 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Strong legs and then, you know, hiking the bowl and, and, you know, starting to like climb mountains and stuff, just totally different. It was very peaceful and just, and a lot of fun. Nice appearance by the dog right there. I like that. That's how you know it's real. That's how you know it's real. Now, I, I don't know why people, and I know why people find you fascinating. It's just because you're different, right? Mm-hmm. You're 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 not what you expect when it comes to, you know, a football player. For the most part, you're 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 just a really interesting dude. And one of the things that people tend to fascinate on, you know, be fascinated by with you is the fashion choices, right? Mm-hmm. And this goes all the way back to the damn dress when we were in college, right? <laughs> yeah. Why why do you think? why do you think that's such a big deal to people? Like, cause I see that's all your stuff. Like that's the biggest reactions for people is about what you're wearing. Yeah. Yeah. I have no clue why people get so like worked up or like get their panties in a bunch about what I'm wearing or what somebody else is wearing or what have you. But I have seven siblings. I have four older sisters and my sisters always put me in girl clothes when I was young. And it was always funny. I have picked so many pictures of me with like a wig on or like, you know, with a smile on my face. And I never thought anything of it. I, never, I wasn't like demasculized or whatever, you know, like I just was having a good time on the kid. And I think with fashion, it's like there's so many people that buy designer things. And, and when you do that, it's like then everyone kind of looks the same. And that's that's not something that's ever been anything that I want to do. Like I, I want to use my creativity to figure out what looks I can pull off and, and have fun with it. And so I still do that. You know, I, I really worked over the last couple of years to bring that little kid back out in me, you know, to have that um, same type of fun and creativity that you know a young person has. And so that's my thing, you know, it's like, we want to put on a mermaid costume because it's a friend's birthday and she likes mermaids. Then like, let's do it. It, it doesn't change who I am. I could take that mermaid costume off and still go out and run a route and catch a ball. And, you know, like none of that stuff changes. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's always interesting to kind of see reactions to that stuff. And it, it honestly makes it like fun. Like I don't really do it for that, but then it's just like, it's hilarious to see how like, much we kind of try and put people in a box sometimes yeah well it's uh you, you got to check out the mermaid uh documentary on i think I did. netflix I did. It, it's I wild I, my wife and i watched the first episode i was like okay this is interesting yeah uh, what's work right now so you're you know you're taking some time you you did you know you, you spent the winter in the mountains you've been been traveling a bit like What's work right now? What's next? Like, what what are some of the things that you've got going right now? Yeah, so, I mean, my main intention and objective right now is, is strictly just enjoying life and figuring out how to find balance between doing that and, and, and service work, showing up for my family, my friends, and in the community. And so, um, you know, there's a couple of passion projects that I have my eyes set on. Uh, you know, I, I was living in Aspen and in the snowboard community, uh, you know, for the first time this year and, you know, working on diversifying the mountain and making the mountain more accessible and um, helping some of the ski companies make uh, the mountain more friendly for, for people of color, just like using the experiences that I've had and, um, you know, the knowledge that I have now because of, of the movement uh, and trying to apply those things to other, to other spaces and other places. Um, there's just so much to be done in the extreme sports world, right? You know, I think about being a newcomer to the space and wanting to know who, you know, were the first black snowboarders to, you know, do a backflip or a 360. Like there's like a database of things that need to be, um, you know, put together f- for us, you know, just so we have the history and, um, so, you know, those, those types of projects, I, I want to get into like acting and directing and producing. I have some stories that I, that I want to tell. Uh, you know, I love the fashion space. So being able to model and design and 
um, just use that creativity, but then also, you know, I'm really passionate about the mental health space and, and want to get into, you know, the retreat center space and wellness centers and um, really continue to push to uh, advocate for, for people to uh, become the best version of themselves, however, you know, they want to do that and to find joy in their lives and, uh, you know, for us to just do a better job as human beings of being good humans, you know, and that's possible. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It just, uh, you know, takes some time and effort. I've seen you talk a lot about the mental health stuff and, and especially how challenging it is for some men to talk about that type of stuff. What, what experiences that you've gone through, like what, what, what has made you so passionate about being so vocal about all of it? Uh, what, has made me passionate is how far I've come. You know, I, as a young person, I look back at my life, I was very like, just like a rebel, still a rebel, but like angry. I had a lot of like built up anger and I don't know what it was, what it was from at the time, you know, I, you know, so maybe it's the way that we were raised or whatever, but, and so I just never thought that I could think the way that I do now. I didn't think it was possible. And so to go through therapy, to, have, you know, work with a life coach, to experiment with, you know, plant medicines and psychedelics, and to come out on the other side of, you know, a depression or being underneath what I call as like a dark cloud, right? To come out from that, to be in the struggle and to come out on the other side here and here, um, it, it becomes, in my mind, a responsibility for us to let other people know that they can have that because I know somebody else thinks that they can't. And I know that I'm in a very privileged position because, um, you know, I've, I've checked all the boxes of all the things that I wanted to accomplish, right? I wanted to take care of my family. I wanted to play in the NFL. I wanted to go to college. Like all the things that, that are like, you know, that you can think about as a kid that you care about. I've done all those things. And so it makes sense that I can like turn the page and be on the other side and have joy and happiness and all these things. But it, it, I was the, the most depressed and like underneath this dark cloud when I had everything, you know, I just signed a new contract, uh, you know, playing the best that I'd ever played, like all, everything was good. And I was in the worst place here. You know, I didn't wake up happy. I didn't look in, in the mirror and find myself happy with myself and the person that I was. And um, to be able to, to have that on a more consistent basis and to work towards it and to know that it exists is what makes me passionate because uh, we all have a purpose here in this, in this life and um, sometimes we don't know that. And um, for, to be able to remind people of that and, and let them know that, that it is possible and uh, we're all capable of having some you know, joy and happiness in our life. Yeah, that's, I think that's awesome. Now, it, obviously, I know it wasn't, wasn't something that, that probably happened instantly or was easy. It's probably something you still work on uh, daily, but it does sound like with the mental health stuff, like maybe there was like an aha moment mm -hmm. where maybe you, you, you finally what what are like realize some of the the stuff that you mentioned from the your childhood some anger some rebellion stuff like what what happened to, that really set you on the path like okay there's there's something here i need to explore i really just got to a point where i didn't like the way that i felt anymore or how i thought about the world you know i was i thought i was strong enough to read all the facebook comments and instagram comments and all this stuff from the protests and all the things people were saying Mentally, and I think I, I mean, you know, I, I was strong enough to read them, but they still had an effect on my subconscious. And so I started to just be really negative and 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 just look at the world differently. And I was in a relationship at the time, and I wasn't doing well in the relationship. I wasn't showing up, um, you know, for my partner the way that I I want to or I wanted to. And uh, then I had you know some of the things that I needed to address from my childhood. Um, and so I kind of had this perfect storm of, of shit happening <laughs> and I, I wanted to, I, I thought that there was more and I wanted to do whatever I can to figure out how to, how to change that. 
And so it was like the perfect storm again of like, okay, I found, I was doing a, a community service event for uh, helping, helping young kids raise money through this restaurant. They had a food truck. And so they were like basically doing a pop-up at this restaurant with a, with a chef and I'm there with the kids and happened to meet a therapist. You know, I'm going around introducing myself to people at this event, shaking hands. And this lady's like, oh, yeah, I'm a therapist. Like, give me her card. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I've been looking for a therapist, you know. And so um, it took me a while to call her, maybe a couple of weeks. But I call her and boom, then I set up a um, my first session with her and start meeting with her once a week. And then Coach Gase, his cousin, was like doing research for like, kids that came from like adverse backgrounds and so he was like hey do you think you could you know talk to my my cousin she just has a couple questions for you maybe take 15 20 minutes and then she'll be done and i'm like yeah sure so her and i sit down and we start talking and we talk for like three hours like after practice we're talking we go into the we go into the cafeteria we're talking and at that time, I think she was just doing like presentations for schools and, and kids and stuff. She wasn't really like a life coach, but like from that moment on, she took me on as like, as like her student, you know, and sending me just different like memes and podcasts and books and her thing. And the thing that really has made the biggest impact on me was um, starting a gratitude journal. So we... The assignment was to find three things that you're grateful for every day, but they have to be three different things. And so at first I'm texting her like every night, you know, and for the first like year and a half, two years, it was really hard. Like the brain was just not dialed in that way to find these good things. I, I wasn't in that place and I wanted to quit a lot of times and but I stuck with it and she made me stay on it. And I, it was like a year and a half, two years to where then I was like, oh, like I started to notice myself just having a better attitude, figuring out ways to find the good in every you know thing that happened. And it was like, I had totally just changed and re rewired the brain. And so um, it just, all of these things were happening at once. And I, I had always been a casual um, user of, you know, mushrooms and, and cannabis and MDMA uh, from high school all the way on. And so I wasn't actively using those things with therapy at the time, but I find myself, um, you know, using the medicines and then having these deep conversations with other men or with my girlfriend at the time or, you know, other friends. And I started to see like, oh shit, like this is, this stuff is helping me like be vulnerable and open up and just have a different perspective. And that's when it really hit me like, oh, okay, like this is, I need to do some more research on this. And, um, but yeah, so it was kind of like these two different storms that were happening that all kind of came together and collided and, and, and pushed me into this place. We'll get you back to the interview, but first... John Vance Auto Group has been serving Oklahomans for 40 years. They're family owned and operated, and they got nine full service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. No matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way which is why they have their lifetime loyalty program. And here's how it works. You buy a new or used car from them. All you have to do is get all of the manufacturer recommended maintenance done at the Vance dealership. And if something goes wrong with any of the components of your engine, transmission, drive, axle, or transfer unit, they will cover the repair costs. It's a great deal. And you can browse their entire inventory or find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. 
All right, back to the interview. You've been you've been an advocate for microdosing for a while, right? And you've even you've reached out to me and been like, "Hey, man, this here's the research behind it." And now you've got Aaron Rodgers talking about the ayahuasca stuff. And like, do you do you think that this is something that's kind of headed to being normal? For especially for people that have, you know, kind of high stress, super competitive lines of work. Like, do you, do you think we're going to get to a place where, you know, it's not viewed the way that it's viewed right now? I think that's tough to say. I mean, we're, we'll make progress for sure. Um, but yeah, there's, there's always going to be pushback when it comes to drugs. You know, people think that these things are drugs. And for the most part, they're in my mind, medicine, you know, and so, when you don't know something and we've all kind of been programmed to think of things a certain way, it's hard to break those patterns, but some of the easier ways to break them is through the medicine. (laughs) And so it's pretty interesting. Like, I don't know, there is like a, maybe a meme or something on Instagram. I don't know if it was real or fake about, you know, some like far right wing guy that did MDMA one time and then was like, Oh, like hit it. Like, just changed the way he thought about all the things that he thought and just wanted to be like rid himself of like hate and anger and all this stuff. And it just like, I think it was a joke, but it's like that it's literally one opportunity for you to like have different perspective of your life and the way you look at things. And it's like, Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe I was looking at that. Not the wrong way, but maybe I was just that. That's not how I truly feel about that. Maybe I had my guard up or I had my walls up or my ego or something was happening that was, putting me in this place. And so, um, yeah, I think we're making progress. There's always going to be pushback, but, um, I don't understand why my thing is, has always been, if, if somebody recommends something to me that I trust, then, uh, you know, if I, if I'm interested in it, then I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. And so, you know, you recommend restaurants to people or you recommend a movie or a show or, you know, and so why are these things any different? why is mental health such a taboo topic you know and then i think the more that we can continue to like normalize the conversation educate ourselves um you know the easier it'll become for people to kind of get on on board and uh, and get on the train i think it's i think it's fascinating and i think it's awesome too uh, but i'm trying to think 15 years ago what would have happened if the whole world basically found out that Peyton Manning was, you know, taking a ayahuasca trip or something like that. I feel like the Aaron Rodgers situation, society's just kind of been like, huh, makes sense. And I feel like it's like already just that is a different place than, than we would have been. 10 12 15 years ago yeah no that's true that's 100 percent true but that's i mean that's what it takes right is somebody like if if peyton manning would have brought it up at that point in time then we you know like think about how much further along we'd be at this point you know it takes somebody to put their neck out there and to kind of you know take that chance and be real and be vulnerable um for us to make the progress and i think we have more and more people uh you know starting to come out and have those conversations and and just understand and know that like, if you can share and save a life, you know, we have people that are, that are taking their lives and that, that don't want to be here. If you could share and I can have an impact enough to save a life, then like, I mean, that's like, that's God's work, you know? So it's, I, I feel like I'm always trying to encourage people. You know, I meet, I met some snowboarders this year that were struggling and that have come out on the other side and they're young, you know, 17, 18 year olds. And, you know, to like see them last year and, you know, they pull me to the side and want to talk and then to see them this year. And they're like, bro, like, I'm just so much better. I really appreciate you talking to me last year. Like I was, I, you know, I tried to, you know, uh, hurt myself. And like, you know, I just like, it's, you don't know what people are going through. And so to have a guy like Aaron Rodgers or what have you share and be real, um, you don't know how many people that saved. And that's fucking, that's incredible. This has been awesome, Kenny. We do have some OU questions for you, though, of course. Now, 
we do this thing called call your shot and it's where people send stuff in and we had a people uh, that listen, sending questions for me, for you. This first one comes from Oki meat guy on Twitter who asks, where does the touchdown catch at Florida state rank in your college career? It's top. It's up there. It's up there. It's, it's tops. It's, it's tops for sure. I was, I was concussed. I don't think a lot of people know that. I ended up. Uh, I knew that. <laughs> I, sat up, I sat up the next game the next week, but I got crushed by uh, what is his name, Lamarcus Joiner, on that double move, and uh, whatever. It kept myself in the game, and uh, so I, I just and just like box, I passed away that year. I was suspended the game before that. I just you know I, it was the way that I feel about that play is, you know, I, I can't say it's number one because there's we just had so many sick moments, but it's up there. It's up there for sure. I'm sorry, Gabe, but I have to ask a follow-up. I'm I'm sorry. The concussion thing. Um did you have multiple? And what do you think any of that had a had anything to do with some of the depression you found yourself in? And what if any effect positively negatively whatever do you think some of the the plant-based medicine has uh has helped in that area yeah so that was the only concussion that i remember from college was super grateful i actually um went to go text jim but didn't have his number then went to go write him on facebook and i couldn't but just was gonna write to him how thankful i was of them for sitting me out the next week because i would have definitely tried to play um but yeah, so very few concussions in my career that were reported. Um, I, how much of that do I feel like played a part in my depression? I, I can't say because I, I, I really just felt like there were so many things that I was holding on to from the way that I was raised and like my relationship with my parents that I think I just, that was what was really like holding me down. And then you combine like, you know, the hatred and the racism and stuff from from the protests that I was feeling and seeing for the first time. Right. So like a San Diego kid, besides our neighborhoods being separated, for the most part, you don't just see like we don't have any community police violence. You don't have nobody just calling people the N word or nothing. You know, I wasn't until I came to Oklahoma, we're down in Texas for the first time that I ever felt like unsafe, you know, around a group of, of white people. You know, we had an incident happen with Tony and I and Brennan, but a whole other story. But, um, and then what was the third part of that? The, I was just asking if you thought that, because there's been some studies about the concussion oh, yeah. stuff. and Yeah, no. So one of the things that I did during my career was to get a baseline test on my brain to see how it was functioning. And so, uh, you know, once things become official with me not playing, I'll go and get like an exit uh scan of the brain to see you know how how it's working now and so we'll see we'll have real results on knowing okay what what has happened how the plant medicine has helped or hasn't and um be able to kind of have my own knowledge but i definitely think um that stuff has helped my theory and is that you know the more that you're using the brain the more that you're like opening up these other areas and these other pathways, the more the brain's working, the way, the better it is able to heal some of those traumas, right? And so um, we'll see how much of that research is true or not, but that's how I feel about the plants and how they work. Yeah, no, and there's, there, there's certainly some interesting research out there now. Now we're gonna shift back to the OU football. Sorry, we got Gabe. serious again. Gosh, now we're going back to the OU football. This one comes from Justin Smith. Kenny asks, who is the most memorable teammate you played with in your time in Norman and why? You don't have to say me because I know it's not true. <laughs> That's a really tough question. I, we, we had a fucking amazing group of guys. Um, but honestly, playing with Ryan and the person that Ryan is and the mentor that he was, uh, that's why, I mean, I, that was part of the reason why I came to school there. You know, I met Ryan, he hosted me on my trip. I knew that I had an opportunity to play early. Um, 
and learn from one of the best in college football and a, a, a genuine, nice, humble dude. And I felt like if I were to ever play at the level that he was, that I wanted to still have that same type of personality and foundation uh, of, a, of a good human being. And so I, I loved all of our guys, uh, but that relationship with Ryan uh, had, a, had a profound impact on me. He also was really, really good at football. Yeah, he was. A, he was a. He was a great guy. Though, little a little broil story for you. My it was spring ball, so I was still playing tight end, and for absolutely no reason, I'm running like the seam on a four vertical. Like ball's not coming my way, not coming my way. Travis Lewis just decleats me for no reason. Like goes out of his way to do it too. Broyles on the next play abandons his route and goes and just lays Travis Lewis the fuck out. Like we're <laughs> talking as hard as he could hit him. <laughs> no warning at all. And I never forgot it. I never forgot it. And it was funny because Broyles got in a fight with Tony in practice and who comes running and just smokes Tony? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> And I don't never. That's the only time Coach Stoops ever got mad at me. He was like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "I, uh, Coach, I, I owed him one. I had to. I'm sorry. I had to. I had to pay my debt." Hell yeah. But Bros is the man. Okay, two more questions for you. This one comes from Big Fat Scott. He says, "As a skill player who successfully made the jump to the NFL after your junior year." Has NIL changed any advice you would give college players about evaluating whether to leave school early? 100%. Yeah, NIL it makes, changes everything. You know, I, I left, be, one, because I felt like I needed to take the next step and, and be challenged at a higher level, but also because it was time to go get this money for my family. You know, we're like, these kids are making – you know, however much money, 250, 500, a million, some, some people a couple million, and they're staying in school. If you can do that, you're, some of those guys are making more than rookie minimum. You know, if you're that level of NIL guy, then it's like, well, why would I go play in the league when I could be here, have another opportunity to build a championship, to continue to fine tune my skill set, and, and also make some money? I mean, it definitely changes the way you think about things, for sure. I think that's a good answer. All right, this is the last one from Ryan Kenyon. What makes a receiving coach elite? Mm. That's a good question. I've that's never it. thought about that. Like what? That's a good question. What it's makes a wide receivers coach elite? It makes it's a combination of things. Uh, obviously, attention to detail and knowing and knowing the game, but also the ability to understand that. It, it's not always going to work out how you draw it on the paper. Sometimes you got to go out there and make plays. So knowing that, being able to motivate your guys and find different ways to motivate them every day. Um, and then just being a good teacher, right? Some guys some guys are great coaches. They're great motivators. They're rah-rah guys. But then you ask them something about coverage or a route and they can't explain it to you. And that then you can't do your job. But I, I think about my favorite receiver coaches. They were always finding different ways to motivate us by telling us different types of stories or like, you know, printing out, you know, the, the headlines from the other team or just always finding a different way to motivate us. Always like high energy, talking trash and, and being a, doing a good job of, of teaching us the game, teaching us, uh, you know, the install and, and not really like babysitting us, letting us go out there and have fun. You got to understand too, like we, we're playmakers, right? You recruited us to come here and make some plays. We know like these are the boundaries within the play and we want to be on the same page with the quarterback. But at the same time, you got to allow us to go out there and, and try and, and win the game for you. Were, were any of your wide receiver coaches former wide receivers? And if so, do you think that helped or do you think that's a part of it? It, it's I don't, I don't know if coach jay played receiver i don't think he played receiver um no maybe my high school coach my private receiver coaches all played receiver but 
Yeah, I don't think any of my coaches. Oh, uh, yeah, my first receiver coach in um in in New Orleans. Oh my god, why, why am I blanking on his name? He was the man too, cold blooded. He was a punt returner as well. Why? Why can I not think of his name? Nine right years, now? man. It was. It's a million years ago. Football life. Yes, but damn, it's gonna come to me after this conversation. But yeah. He was the man. He and and I know we didn't know. So like my rookie year, he's walking around the locker room. He got like this little like cool ass step. I'm like, damn. I wonder why OG blocks like that. <laughs> and then before one of the games, you know, we it wasn't like the first week. It was like later in the season. He was like, I got something for y'all. Henry and, Ellard. Yes, Henry Ellard. Sorry about that. Henry, Google. Boom. Coach Ellard, Coach Ellard pulls up his highlights, and I I had never seen him. They're you know he's an old head, so I had never seen him. And he pulled out his highlights, and I was like, oh shit, that's why that motherfucker walks like that, smooth, <laughs> smooth as hell. He was cold, but he did a front flip into the end zone off a punt return one time. Like he he's the man. And so two but that's about, two funny. time first team All Pro, three time Pro Bowler. <laughs> Led the league in receiving yards in 88. Yeah, I'd say he knew what he That's was doing. That's crazy, and I don't know if I've ever even heard that name. How is that possible? Yeah. That's, that's awesome. What saying, you know, that's what I'm saying. Finding ways yeah. to motivate your guys. You know, like, he's an old head. He figured, like, okay, these guys are, you know, they're they're just falling asleep over here. Let me show them something. And has the, has the team pull up his highlights. And we're up in there like, oh, shit. And so, um, yeah, no, I love it. That's great. You're the man. This was awesome, man. I appreciate you. I uh, always love catching up, man. Love you. Same, same. Love you, love you guys. I appreciate you having me. Say amen. Man, that was a journey. I, he, he's such a cool guy. Like, he's so much cooler than us, man. Like, I know. Just, he's, I, know. I as, as one of his friends and former teammates, it brings me a lot of joy to see where he's at in life right now. It, it really does. And man, that guy's got some stories. Yeah. Got some good stories. Um, I, I, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm thrilled with where he is. I'm glad he made a buttload of money in the NFL and he can pursue some of these, these interests that he's had and has, has been building for some time. It sounds like, and, I, I, I just, I, I just can't say it enough. I'm happy for him. It's awesome. Yeah. And that, I don't, that's unlike any other episode we've ever done. Yeah. You know, normally it's football, football, football. And, you know, there was a lot of football in there, but a lot of life. And that's it's way more long form podcast ish than what we typically are. Yeah. I, I imagine some people listen to that and they go, I did not. That is not what I was expecting to listen to, but hope y'all enjoyed it. Cause I, that was a great conversation. I was, I was totally interested the entire time. So it worked for me. Yeah. <laughs> worked for us. So sorry <laughs> if you didn't like it. Cause we enjoyed it on that note, episode 332 in the books. We'll have a new podcast. that will drop Wednesday. Ted, one of our favorites, baby. Q and a yes, the listeners have sent questions and we shall answer them. Just a reminder. You can hear Teddy from three to six on 94, seven, the ref. You can hear me on Sirius XM big 12 radio channel three seventy five. Hope you all have an awesome 4th of July. And until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do. Oklahoma take care of each other.